All right, man, peace. So for those of you brothers that frequent my channel and have been on my channel for long enough, you know that one of the main themes, one of the main motifs that I like to revisit from time to time is the concept of the so-called black man understanding his importance as being the person who is supposed to preside over the household and is supposed to be the main decision maker, being able to discern what's going on around him and the main aspect of the so-called black man's control is supposed to be over his children, particularly over his male child, over his son. Because that's you in the replication. So that's why I have the series Black Man Guard Your Seed. That's the most important thing that we're ever going to generate is our seed. That's the most valuable thing that we have. That's why we have to be so cognizant of who we impregnate, who we inseminate. Because it's going to be a direct reflection on us the type of female that we choose to inseminate. It's also going to be a direct reflection on us how our children turn out. Because at the end of the day, nobody wants to hear about how the system is out against the so-called black man. People don't want to hear that. When you're someone of higher intellect, higher level comprehension abilities, it's a very poor reflection on you when you know better but don't do better. For the so-called black men to always talk about how the system is rigged, well then that means that we have to adapt to our environment. We have to engineer ourselves so that we can engineer what's going on around us. And Denzel Washington, the superstar actor, he pretty much made the same statement when he was asked a very low level question by a liberal slash woke black man who happened to be interviewing him about a film. And of course, Denzel's response to this brother's question has made a bit of a wave across the Internet, across social media, particularly in many of the quote unquote woke pro black circles, because he didn't conform to the paradigm of self victimization. He did not allow the interviewer to put him in the position where he was going to destroy any potentiality that he has to make a greater impact in the cinematic industry by trying to polarize himself against this society when in reality with us being kings as we allege ourselves to be we have to be able to navigate this society with a far greater deal of understanding as opposed to always looking to the so-called white man to change this and change that what do i mean by that that means that we have to attack this system from the ground floor not from the top. Liberal woke blacks, they always want to address the so-called white man and what he's supposed to change. When we change our conduct, we can engineer this system and manipulate it in the same way that all the other races do. But it starts with the so-called black man. It doesn't start with us trying to constantly interact with Caucasians and trying to guilt them into changing laws because we want to depict ourselves as perpetual victims. Nobody's buying it. Nobody's buying that the so-called black man is a victim. We have to empower ourselves in the best way possible. We have to strategize. We have to discipline ourselves to the best of our ability. And we have to take great strides in our ability to understand what's going on around us. I cannot stress that enough. There are too many dim-witted members of our so-called community who are intent on trying to lower the level of comprehension and the, and the level of mental acuity as opposed to trying to raise their level of mental acuity and it's acting as a direct reflection on our people and it makes us look very pitiful and no one ever respects someone that's pitiful when people view you as an object of pity they don't respect you and our people have to get that through their skulls now Denzel Washington has started to come forth more and more with his own understanding of how the so-called black man needs to resolve his issues. For those of you who've seen the film that he's just had released into theaters, The Equalizer 2, he touched on that theme in that film where he had that great scene with the so-called young black man where he told him, I don't want to hear you trying to blame this and that and the system and the white man. You have the ability to succeed at what your goals are. You just have to create goals for yourself. And this is a major problem in the so-called black community. You have many so-called young black men who have an idea of what they want to be, but they get dissuaded from following 
their vision and their dream by the dregs of the so-called black community. And once they follow those dregs, then they try to assist themselves. They try to assuage their own guilt at their own lack of discipline for sticking to their goals by saying, well, the system did this and the system did that and the cops are out to get me. And that's a major problem. But anyway, we're going to let Denzel speak. And of course, I'm going to chime in. There was something I read where you talked about your people from Mount Vernon saying that, you know, like they've done like 40 years in a penitentiary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, incarceration rates in America has been a problem, especially as opposed to minorities. And Roman delves into this, the issues around the, the legal system. Do you think we've made any headway? And I think it's more important to make headway in our own house. By the time the system comes into play, the damage is done. They're not locked. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And this is why I come out against many of these protests and the liberal blacks so much, because they're low level thinkers. They want to blame the system when if you were doing a good job as a parent, you should have been informing your child about the system and what he or she can take advantage of as opposed to what he or she can fall prey to. You should be informing your child about what the school system is actually about and how you have to use the school system. The school system is not there to inform you or educate you, it's there to indoctrinate you. And you have to take what's usable and you have to ignore the rest. You have to use the system, not try to plug yourself into it. Our people are trying to plug themselves into the system. That's why they're so offended by it. And every other race comes to America and they understand that America is a whore. America is not a wife. You use a whore. You don't try to marry a whore. I say that over and over again. And the reason why our people are so emotionally disturbed is because they spend so much time trying to figure out how they can marry America. And America does not want to marry you. America is a whore, it's not a wife. But once again, so important for the so-called black man to preside over his household. How does he start doing that? By using a far greater deal of scrutiny when he's deciding who he's going to impregnate. Enough seven-year-olds. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I was in Chicago a couple of three, four weeks ago, and we saw these little kids on bikes with masks on the side of their head, like five or six of them. And the driver said, yeah, they're little yummies. I said, who? He said, little, little yummies. Look up. Google little yummy. Mm. Little yummy was an 11-year-old murderer. Wow. And you look at his picture, you'll see the headshot of him, and he's like this. And he got murdered at 11 by a 14-year-old. Wow. Yes, Lil Yummy was a member, I believe, of the Gangster Disciples out in Chicago. And unfortunately, Lil Yummy was an example of a child that not only never had a second chance, he never had a first chance. He was born to a prostitute mother, and by all accounts... He was brutalized from his infancy. He had cigarette burns on him from the age of three, so on and so forth. His father was a John to his mother, who once again was a prostitute. He was taken out of his mother's home by Child Protective Services, moved into his grandmother's home. And by all accounts, the grandmother's home was as abusive as the mother's home. So once again, this is why the so-called black man has to preside over his household now. His father was nothing but a John. His father ran and skidded up in a prostitute. A prostitute who most likely was brutalized herself when she was a child. Most likely by her mother and also whatever male figures were around her. Which led her to go into prostitution. Who knows, maybe she was sexually abused as well. And she was most likely physically abused as well. For you to put out cigarettes on a child. That must be a learned behavior. Or you're some type of sadistic. Either way, Lil Yummy, real name Robert Sandifer, he never had a first chance, much less a second chance. By the age of seven or eight, he was stealing luxury cars. By the age of 11, he was engaging in shootouts in public and spraying up crowds. One shootout, of course, uh, there was a person who got hit with a stray bullet and died. Young person, I can't, can't remember if it was a girl or a boy. And, of course, the gangster disciples were worried. That if and when the police caught Robert Sandifer, a.k.a. Lil Yummy, that he was going to snitch 
on what was going on in the gang. So they lured him to an underpass and they blew his brains out. A 14 year old blew his brains out. Who's currently serving, I believe, a 45 year prison sentence. His brother also got a heavy prison sentence, I believe 60 years. I read an interview on the 14 year old who killed Robert Sandifer. And he was talking about how apologetic he was. Of course, this was years down the line while still incarcerated. He was talking about how apologetic he was and how he got caught up in the gang life. And he happened to come from a home that had two parents in it. So, of course, just because you come from a two parent home does not mean that you're necessarily going to grow up to be an upright individual. And just because you're a man who presides over your home, that does not mean that all your children are going to be upright. But you have to eliminate as many variables as possible by making sure that you choose the right woman to inseminate. I cannot stress that enough. So many brothers are impregnating these females and you don't really know them and you're just trying to keep them around. And that's not really what life is about. You have to make sure that you use great scruples, that you're very meticulous in your decision making process on who's going to receive your seed because your seed is the most valuable thing that you will ever ever create and that's before you use it to impregnate a woman it's of extreme value it's worth more than fine gold I cannot stress that enough who's doing life now in a 16 year old that makes no sense you blame the system where was his father now did you hear what the interviewer stated as Denzel was explaining this this issue this phenomenon the interviewer stated it makes no sense well that's part of the problem you don't have the mental acuity to make sense of what Denzel Washington is trying to explain to you because you're an emotionally disturbed liberal pro-black who's trying to get on TV to campaign for change in the system as opposed to what we should be campaigning which is to change the level of understanding of our people so that they could raise up to a higher level of comprehension which is what Denzel Washington is trying to do. Now, in regards to Denzel as a person, of course, if you truly were to investigate Denzel Washington's acting career, I believe that he has some nebulous origins. That's another video for another day. But in regards to what he's espousing here, I completely agree. Unequivocally, I agree. And he clearly is speaking from the standpoint of someone who has a ruling class mentality and is trying to accentuate the importance a fatherhood, which is what this society is trying to tear down because they know that once you have the woman in control of the home, you basically have control of the children. Because the woman is not a three dimensional thinker and she's thoroughly plugged into the state. That's how the woman operates. Of course, are there exceptions to the rule? Absolutely. But for the most part, the woman is going to conform to her environment. She's not going to question much what's going on in her environment. That's why I tell you, brothers, most of these liberal black women that you see leading these protests and marches, they're lesbians looking for attention. All right. But that's another video for another day. It starts in the house. It starts in the home. And yeah, well, well my father got locked up. Well, where was his father? Yeah. You know, that, that, the, like I, I did talk about my three closest friends and they did, you know, 15 to 25. One did 28, this and that. I was the only one of the three that had a father in my life, even though my parents were together, but I still had a father who was a gentle man and a good example, yeah. and they didn't. We can blame the system if we want, but they didn't lock any of us up at seven. Yeah. We were all doing enough to get locked up at 13. My parents sent me in another direction. They didn't have anybody to help them, and they... Now, did you hear what Denzel Washington stated there? He said we were all doing enough to get locked up at 13. Now 12 years old, 13 years old is a pivotal time in the life of a young boy, especially a so-called young black boy, because that is when he starts to raise to a higher level of understanding of what's going on around him because of his hormonal changes. There's a certain level of mind activation and awareness that he goes through at that age. And you, you have these different stages in your life where you jump in comprehension. What they call puberty is one of those stages where you start to want to experiment in different ways, get involved in different groups to, to find out where you fit in. 
and that normally is the age 12 or 13 years old where the children start to rebel against the parents especially if they're in a single mother household I've stated this phenomenon in other videos because of the way that the man has decided to rebel against the Most High the so-called black man let me specify the Most High has put the spirit on the woman to rebel against him and because the woman has rebelled against the man the Most High has put the spirit on the children to rebel against the woman so it's nothing but confusion because nobody wants to follow the chain of command and that's why I stayed all the time my channel is geared towards the so-called black man this is not a pro-black channel on um, pro-black channels all they want to do is talk shit all day be two-dimensional thinkers talk about how they're woke but they have no understanding of what's going on around them and for the most part they're as worried about catering to the so-called black woman as they are to the so-called black man and that is not going to lead to any progress you have to respect the chain of command for there to be progress because what happens is that most of those forums start to descend to bickering and the gender war and all that is is a distraction so-called black man the gender war is a distraction it has been set up implemented and promoted and propagated to keep men particularly so-called black men from understanding what's going on around them and having a sense of peace because men in their rightful nature they want to understand what's going on around them women are more about their feelings how they feel at this moment or that moment now when a man has a higher understanding of what's going on around him then he can explain things to his woman or his women and they grow closer that's how that dynamic works that's how it's supposed to work you're not supposed to have men and women in the same forum receiving the same information in the same way it's not going to be conducive to an orderly environment kept doing what they was doing and the system got them so i i don't the, the system is rigged but why all the more reason not to help it speak up thank you sir i could not put it any better myself i know for a fact I couldn't put it any better myself because I've put it in the same terms in previous videos. Even a rat, even a rat, when it starts to understand how a rat trap works, will no longer put its head into the rat trap. It will avoid bait once it recognizes a rat trap. For the so-called black man, now that you know that the system is set up against you, we'll have to figure out ways around it. Now that we know that there's a prison industrial complex, it behooves us to let go of criminality, or at least the embracing of the culture of criminality. That's what we have to let go of. We have to let go of the culture of being a quote-unquote thug. We have to let go of the culture of woman worship and simpism. We have to let go of the embracing of the drug culture. We have to let go of these things so that we can understand how to recalibrate our environment and I say this all the time for a lot of you brothers especially a lot of you younger brothers when you have aspirations you most likely are going to have to be a loner there's nothing wrong with that don't succumb to the peer pressure of feeling like you have to fit in and join any type of clique or group the bigger the crowd the dumber the crowd I'll say it again the bigger the crowd the dumber the crowd all right so when you have goals and you want to achieve them don't worry about being by yourself on the back end you can go to all the clubs and the parties and get all the broads once you have the opportunity to make sure that you're able to earn a living for yourself in a healthy way in a mentally healthy way a spiritually healthy way and also a legal way that's the best way that's really the only way and that's how we're able to not fall victim to quote unquote victim to or pray to the prison industrial complex the fatherhood olivia malcolm jd all doing great things so you you know what let me rewind this back a little bit way and i think it's more important to make headway in our own house by the time the system comes into play the damage is done they're not locking up seven-year-olds you know, I, I was in Chicago a couple of three, four weeks ago, and we saw these little kids on bikes with masks on the side of their head, like five or six of them. And the driver said, yeah, they're little yummies. 
I said, who? He said, Lil Yummy. Look up. Google Lil Yummy. Lil Yummy was an 11-year-old murderer. Wow. And you look at his picture, you'll see the headshot of him, and he's like this. And he got murdered at 11 by a 14-year-old. And let me say this, as bad as it might sound, Lil Yummy was on his way to becoming a serial killer. Okay? You have different types of serial killers. You have the Jeffrey Dahmer, John Wayne Gacy, Ted Bundy type, who do it because they have a love of gore. And then you have dudes running around these different communities that had, at least back in the day, not so much today because with the camera surveillance, it's harder to put up big numbers in regards to killing people. But back then in the 80s and 90s, yeah, dudes that had 30, 40 bodies on them. No problem. Especially if they was involved in the gang life and in the drug trade. Those are serial killers too. And Lil Yummy was on his way to being one. So to be quite frank with you, that was an example of the jungle restoring order to a certain degree. One person was removed who was going to do nothing but destroy his community. And another person was removed who decided that he was going to partake in that dog-eat-dog -dog mentality. That being the 14-year-old, I believe his last name is Hardaway, who was taken off the streets and incarcerated. So brothers, once again, we cannot fall victim to that low-level brand of thinking. We just cannot. Well, who's doing life now in the 16-year-old? That makes no sense. You blame the system? Where was his father? Yeah. It starts in the house. It starts in the home. And let me say this once again, because I'm sure that many brothers will say, well, I'm trying to be a father, but the woman won't let me. Brothers, once again, by the time you're in a situation where you have to go back and forth with a liberal woman, you almost have to pay for choosing the wrong woman to impregnate. And that's the best thing that I could tell you. You are going to have to deal with her foolishness for 18 years and even beyond that for not doing your due diligence in choosing the right woman. It just is what it is. So for brothers who have to deal with what they call baby mama drama, that's par for the course. You have to look at your child as an investment, as a stock that you have to help grow and not be so concerned about what the woman is doing or not doing. If she's going to decide that she's going to be an impediment to you raising your child, then that's why you have the court system for. You have to be as willing and as ready to utilize the court system as they are. And for many of these malicious women, they're too stupid to even understand that what they're doing is illegal. You have to accentuate that. You have to stress that by utilizing the court system. But that's why when I make these videos and I give my perspective, I don't get into the whole baby mama drama going back and forth with the woman. I tell, I tell you brothers all the time, you're not supposed to argue with women. The woman either gets it or she doesn't. It's your job to make sure that she gets it. It's your job to make sure that she's fully assembled, right? Including batteries. You have to make sure that the woman comes out the box, no assembly required. If you have to teach the woman basic things about respecting the masculine principle, that's not a wife, that's a concubine. Might not even be that. Might not even be that. But well, certainly not a wife, not someone that you should be trying to impregnate. And yeah, well, well, my father got locked up. Well, where was his father? Yeah. You know, that, 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 the, like I, I did talk about my three closest friends, and they did, you know, 15 to 25, one did 28, this and that. I was the only one of the three that had a father in my life, even though my parents were together. But I still had a father who was a gentle man and a good example. Yeah. And they didn't. We can blame the system if we want, but they didn't lock any of us up at seven. Yeah. We were all doing enough to get locked up. At 13, my parents sent me in another direction. They didn't have anybody to help them, and they kept doing what they was doing. What Denzel said here reminds me of that scene in Boys in the Hood, where Lawrence Fishburne's character, Furious Styles, he tells his son Trey. He says, you know, your friend Doughboy and his brother, they don't have a father. He said, you're my son. You're my problem. They're not my problem. And you saw what happened to Doughboy and Ricky. They both ended up dead to gun violence. While Trey, because he had the father, was able to transcend to a certain degree, especially in pivotal moments like in the scene where Doughboy was driving to go find Ricky's killer and Trey was in the back seat. 
And he was thinking about all the things that his father had taught him. And how that masculine energy from his father started to resonate within him. And he realized that he had to get out of that car and out of that environment. Because the only way to alleviate the problems in the so-called black community is to get rid of that cesspool mentality. That cesspool atmosphere and seek after order. And that's the way that we're going to find success. And the system got him. So I, I don't, the, the system is rigged, but why? all the more reason not to help it. Thank you, sir. I really, I, I can't put it any better than that. I've already stated that. When you know that something is set up to destroy you, then that means that you're complicit in your own destruction. When you succumb to what that trap is trying to lure you in with. When you know that there's a system that's out here to incarcerate so-called black men, why are you getting involved in selling drugs? Why are you getting involved in gang banging? Why are you getting involved in shooting your brother? Why are you doing all those things for? Why are you getting involved in knocking up all these random women, bringing children into the world that are not going to have a real father figure, and are going to grow up and bring even more confusion into their own environment? So you're acting as an agent of chaos in your own community. And we can't have that. Okay, so now here's a, another very interesting interview where Denzel Washington stated some more of his ideas or understandings on life that once again correspond to things that I've been stating on this channel for a while now in regards to the difference between quote-unquote color and culture. Because I cannot accentuate this enough. Your color is not a race. And I say this all the time. That's why I use the term so-called black. And many so-called black people come on my channel and they're confused as to why I say the things that I say and use some of the terms that I use in regards to saying so-called black or so-called black man. So on and so forth. That term black is a corporate designation. It does not indicate race. It does not indicate history. It doesn't indicate ethnicity. It does not indicate any type of etymology or origin, anything of that nature. All the term black is is a corporate designation. And that term is used, especially here in the Western Hemisphere, to describe the indigenous and aboriginal population so that their origins can purposefully be obfuscated so that they have no understanding of who they are and where they come from. And therefore, they're going to look to the state to give them all forms of elucidation or quote unquote illumination that they can get. They're going to look to the government. They're going to trust them as opposed to having a culture to lean on. That's why these other societies, that's why these other races are stronger than so-called black people when they come to America because they can lean on their culture. The so-called West Africans, they also are considered quote unquote black. But when they come to America, they're in a far more advantageous position than so-called black people within one generation because of the strength of their culture. They don't lean on skin color. They lean on culture. And Denzel Washington is going to explain this to a degree, at least to the best of his ability in this interview here. The interviewer, by the way, is a liberal black female by the name of Karen Hunter. This is the female that Stephen A. Smith is always talking about. But, you know, talking about her, that's another video for another day. So let's see what Denzel has to say here. So why did he need a uh, black director? Could a white director not have? It's not color. Work? It's culture. S explain the difference, because I think we're, we're Steven in Steven Spielberg right now. did Schindler's List. Mm -hmm. Martin Scorsese did Goodfellas, right? Steven Spielberg could direct Goodfellas. Martin Scorsese probably could have done a good job with Schindler's List. But they're cultural differences. You know, I know, you know, we all know what it is when a hot comb hits your hair on a Sunday morning, mm -hmm. what it smells like. Huh? That's a cultural difference, not just a color difference. All right. So it's a culture. You know about it? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, Denzel Washington explained to the best of his ability what so called quote unquote African American quote unquote culture is. Now, for you brothers who've been on my channel for long enough, you know that I always state that our people don't have a real culture. Because to me, a real culture denotes language. It denotes customs. It denotes an understanding of history. Our people don't have any of that. At least, not to any degree of completion. 
we just don't have that. But if but yeah, if you want to talk about things like hot combs and being able to dance well and being able to come up with different forms of slang and being being able to come up with new forms of music, absolutely. Yes, that's our quote unquote culture if you want to call it that. Also how we prepare food, things of that nature. Obviously. But in regards to having a real culture, no, our people don't have that because it's been cut off from us. But I just wanted to use that segment here because Denzel Washington also has an understanding of the difference between color and culture. Your color is not a culture. Your color is not a race. Hot comb. So now I... No, she don't know about no hot comb. Uh-huh. 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 Because that's... You don't, that's know, you don't know nothing about... Huh? Uh-huh. 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 See how everybody laughs? That's a cultural difference. Yeah. That's not a race difference. That's just that motion. That's all I got to say, right? I know what a hot comb is. Okay. okay. All right. Let me say this also about the concept of the hot comb. That's always existed. For you brothers who read the scriptures, if you read Isaiah the third chapter, where the Most High is speaking on the curse that he was going to put on the women of Israel, particularly the women of the southern kingdom, there's a term that's used there in Isaiah the third chapter when you read down. Third chapter, around the 17th or 18th verse, maybe the 19th verse. The term crisping pen. The term crisping pen was an ancient term or really a medieval term by that time because the translators used that term crisping pen. That was a term for a hot comb. That's what our people use in the ancient time to style their hair in different ways. Our people would style their hair in various ways. Sometimes they'd wear it in an afro. Sometimes they would braid it. Sometimes they would straighten it and style it in different ways. And this method of styling so-called black hair was all the way from the ancient world throughout the medieval time period. Because if you ever view many of the kings of medieval Europe, sometimes you see that they had an afro. Sometimes you see that they had their hair straightened. So that's why that term was used when you read Isaiah the third chapter of crisping pen because they were very familiar with the tool that they would use to straighten their hair. Now just to go a little further for any of you brothers that may happen to possess a Latin Vulgate. When you go into the Latin in Isaiah, the third chapter, the term that is translated crisping pen is acus. And when you look up the word acus, spelled A-C-U-S, it's also talking about a hot pen or a hot comb. Once again, don't take my word for it. Look it up. The the, the space that we're in, culture versus race and how important it is, you know. um... And once again, that's how you know that when the Most High was speaking through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah the third chapter, those women that he was speaking about, they were so-called black women. There's a lot about our history that our people don't know. Where we are right now as a culture, as a as an American family, um, you're producing a film that's culturally germane to a particular time and a particular people. You know, the the even the Martin Luther King, JFK, uh, Jesus, uh, trilogy, you know, triumvirate that that was on the wall. Uh, we didn't have that on our wall, but our next door neighbor did. Um, and yes, that's the Luciferian triumvirate that has been a staple on the walls of many so-called black people since the early 60s of having JFK and Martin Luther King, who were both Luciferians, as well as the Caucasian image of quote-unquote Jesus Christ on the wall. All three of those people have been used to moderate and control the so-called black community for the last 55, 60 years when used together, when used in unison. And it's, that's what you're talking about? I put that in there. Uh, you did that? <laughs> yeah, Because that was on your, that on your wall? Oh, right? you, that 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 you know, and there was that velvet, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> the, you know, they put that below, whatever they call that velvet. Yeah. Every, did you have it on your wall, Viola? Jesus. I didn't have nothing on my wall when I was growing up, but that's something else. I'm not surprised. You pretty much don't have much in your spirit either. If you follow behind this female, Viola Davis, and you see many of her associations, affiliations, and even that television show that she's on, it's very clear what she's about. High level Lucifer, but that's another video for another day. Stephen, did, did, was Jesus?
pictures on your wall with with JFK? Uh, uh, some of the family members, but you know, uh, uh, but uh, not JFK. I didn't didn't have that up there. No. Okay. But I mean, but I went in the houses where yeah, that was that, there. That was I mean, I, I mean, I mean, I yeah. really went into a lot of houses. I grew up in Kansas City, and yeah, no, absolutely JFK, saw that. JFK. Absolutely saw. That. Absolutely, because those photos or those depictions, when used together, are meant as a psychological programming utility for the so-called black community, especially for the, the so-called black women right before the feminist movement. When you'd have those photos in your home all in tandem, the black female would see that and she would know that she had to stay moderated. She had to stay under control in regards to the society. That's why you saw the so-called Black Panthers, which operated more according to a quote-unquote militant bent. They embraced atheism because they associated those images with control. Their problem was they had no understanding of the truth and the true origins of our people. But that's, an, that's another topic. That's another video for another day. Because the so-called Black Panthers were Marxists and they were founded under the inspiration of Marxism so-called black Marxists like Franz Fanon, etc. But yes, though, when, when you see in many of these black homes, even today, they have those photos up on the wall altogether because so-called black people believe that John F. Kennedy cared about them and liked them. John F. Kennedy's on record as stating that he knew nothing about the so-called black community. The whole Martin Luther King project fell into his lap and he was put in a position where he had to work with this man. And what John F. Kennedy would tell Martin Luther King was, you have to watch your associations. Because as I stated in the video that I did on Martin Luther King, and I will be revisiting him later on, it was well known that he was a communist because he had communist ties. And JFK took him aside and they walked through the Rose Garden, I believe it was, and he told me, he said, Martin, look, we know who you're associated with. And you have to disassociate from these people. Or... They're going to get you in a lot of trouble. That was JFK's way of telling Martin Luther King, I know that you're a communist, but you're useful right now in regards to what you're doing for so-called black people. You're useful to us. You're not a threat to us. But if you don't separate from these people, we're going to have to take you down with them. And Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, who was privy to many of the Martin Luther King tapes, stated or is alleged to have stated that Martin Luther King was not a good person. That's according to her. All right. But once again, those three photos, when used in tandem, they've been used since the early 60s to control and moderate so called black people. It was in, in, it was in my house. It was yeah. in your house, Michael yeah. T. You don't seem old enough to have Jesus. Uh, I don't know. Well, you, listen, you know, I, huh? I'm 59 years old. Oh, are you? Yeah, this is my 50th year in entertainment this year. Oh, good. Man. So. Yeah, now you quiet. Yeah, I, <laughs> hey, I, I had to shut the hell up. Uh, I had to sit, I'm gonna sit back right now. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. But you the truth deal. is, uh, we had white Jesus in my house. You had white Jesus? White Jesus. Mm -hmm. I remember my brother brought home a black Jesus. My mother made him carry that back outside. Because why is that? This is why I let this video play for so long. And notice that Michael T. Williamson accentuated the, the understanding that he had the white Jesus in his home. And when his brother brought the black Jesus into the home, the mother had him take that outside because she associated any type of deification or imagery of the so-called black man as a deity as being of Satan. OK, so that's why I state that when that image of the Caucasian Christ was placed in the so-called black home that was used for psychological manipulation, psychological programming, and it worked very well. A lot of the so-called pro-blacks, they talk about how the Bible's the white man's book and how the white man gave us the Bible. A lot of that is the trickle-down effect of the psychological programming of the Caucasian image of Christ and how it was engrafted into the church system. Most of our people have never read the Bible. They have no understanding of the Bible. If you read the Bible, you understand that there's no way that the Caucasian man could have presided over the Bible in any way, shape, or form. Because all the tenets of the Bible are contrary to the tenets of this modern day society. This society promotes transgenderism, homosexuality, feminism, a credit based economic system, and the Bible teaches against all of those things. 
So it's important that people understand what they're speaking about. But I understand why our people associate the Bible with the Caucasian man and a lot of his imperialistic ways. Because the Bible was used as a prop to promote imperialism in the early to mid 1800s when the Caucasian man first came fully into power. All right. But this is why I wanted to let this video play because of what Michael T. Williamson was stating about his mother. Because what it did was it proved my statement that that triumvirate of Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy, and the white image of Christ were used to psychologically program so-called black households back in the 50s and 60s, especially after John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King were both quote-unquote assassinated. Thereafter, in the late 60s, a lot of more quote-unquote conservative black households who did not want to submit to the militant mindset of the Black Panthers and many of the other black militaristic groups that started to pop up in the mid to late 60s, they still wanted to hold on to, to the hope of coming together with the Caucasian. They used those photos as totems. Was she thought it was being disrespectful. You understand? But uh, th that's fear of being who you are. Um, I think August Wilson gives us power to be who we are. And I think that's the beauty of Well, that's pretty much it on what I wanted to cover in this video. Michael T. Williamson understands it, and he understood that his mother was placed under programming. That she was fearful of just the image of Christ depicting a so-called black man. Because she had been taught her whole life that the so-called black man was nothing. And that's still an issue that our people struggle with to this day. Now, of course, our people have... A far higher level of understanding in regards to the Bible and who it was referring to and the imagery of the people within it. They have a far they have a far higher understanding than our people had back then. But at the same time, there are also far more so-called black atheists, so-called black Luciferians, so-called black agnostics, so-called black Satanists than back then. So it is what it is. That's how you know that we're nearing the time of the reaping. But that's basically it on that. I just wanted to cover this issue because Denzel Washington touched on a series of motifs that I also like to cover on my own channel. That being the so-called black man starting to shun victimhood. They try to promote victimhood on the so-called black man, especially black boys, because that's a way to utilize the liberal black woman and place her in a more prominent position. If you notice, it's normally the liberal black woman who teaches her son that he should be fearful. There's a lot of fear mongering that goes on in the so-called black community. And once again, that's why it is incumbent upon the so-called black man to take back control of his household. How do you do that? By utilizing far greater discretion in who we inseminate. That's the bottom line of it. So peace.